Hello, my name is Dave Keating and I practice in Seattle, Washington. I've got three practices and a big part of my practice is myopia management. And uh, so I would like to share with you the state of the union on myopia and where we are at as of 2023. At the time of this recording, there are a couple of things that are hopefully going to be launched in the next couple of months. And potentially when you're listening to this, it uh, could have already happened or uh, is going to be soon happening. That's the, the thing about uh, uh, having having such great myopia uh, technology. It's, it's ever evolving and we're getting new things all the time. Um, I do want to disclose that I have no financial interest in any of the products that are mentioned here. However, I do have uh, some disclosures of some companies that I work with. Um, I, uh, I have an opportunity to work as a consultant or have spoken on behalf of, and we also do research in my practice with a lot of the companies uh, around myopia, dry eye, and specialty contact lenses. If you're interested, you can um, scan my link tree and that'll take you to some of the resources as well as my, uh, my social media handles and so forth. I also have a myopia podcast, which is the uh, way that I probably get most of my information around myopia is by interviewing other people that are leaders in the myopia space. Um, I learn a ton from it and uh, get to uh, get to get a little bit smarter every single time I talk with one of those experts. Now, you may be listening to this podcast be or this this presentation because you currently do myopia management. The reality is very few optometrists, uh, ophthalmologists, and contact lens fitters are in fact doing myopia management. It still is a very small segment of the eye care population. And some people say, well, I do myopia management. I, spe I, I prescribe spectacle lenses. Well, the reality is that is not managing myopia. That is allowing myopia to manage itself. Our greatest challenge is not that we don't have myopia treatments, it's that we have a refusal to call myopia a disease. Here's some things that help me realize that this is a disease. The prevalence of myopia in the United States has soared by 66% since the 1970s, and that percentage is actually going up. It's continuing to progress. As we look around myopia in, in the country, or around the world, 75% of people in Singapore have myopia. In Hong Kong, it's 80%, and a staggering 97% of the population in South Korea has myopia. And this is a major problem. In parts of China, 90% of the school children who are uh, graduating have myopia. The Chinese government is seeing this as a major obstacle to their future and are realizing that there must be some things that are done. And they're opening optometry schools. They're opening uh, centers to enhance the myopia management that is occurring within their country. And uh, if we don't take it serious here in the United States, in North America, and other parts of the world, we're going to be left behind uh, in parts of uh, in parts of China, they have uh, they have home rooms that rooms that have tons of lighting um, to try to enhance and reduce the progression of myopia. They have school desks and particular times for exercises to be done. Now, I said that myopia is increasing, and here's a great example of that. We developed a whole new realm of myopia called the quarantine myopia. What they did in China is they evaluated all of the school children um, it, it, within a population. They, they identified thousands and thousands and thousands of kids, and they screened them. In fact, I, I believe 123,000 children were screened to find out whether they were myopic. And in the, in the ages of six years old, prior to the pandemic, um, the uh, the the prevalence of myopia was about 5.76%. Following the quarantine period, um, it had gone to 21.5% of the school age six-year-old kids. So that doesn't mean that the 6% went up to be 21%. That means the kids that turned six years old when they were six, their increase in myopia increased by 15, nearly 16%. In the United States, it's no different. Your, your practice is seeing more myopia as well, and they're seeing it younger and younger and younger school children. 
Across the globe, the awareness of myopia is on the rise. In fact, between the time periods of 2019 and the mid-2020, there were over a thousand papers that were published on myopia. In the literature, there's over 400 definitions of myopia. I had a chance of interviewing Monica Young, who at the time was an executive director for the International Myopia Institute. The IMI puts together publications that review all these other publications that are out there, and she did an incredible job. You can see these white papers uh, in, in the literature just by checking out, uh, Googling International Myopia Institute. The evidence is very clear that if you have two parents who are myopic, you have a six times greater risk. And we're not quite sure if it is a genetic component because we haven't found a myopia gene, but it's like you do the things that your parents do and you've done things like your parents have done. And if your parents are myopic, there may be some environmental components that you're doing similar to them. Uh, likewise, if you become myopic before the age of six or seven, you have a 6.6 .6 times greater risk of developing high myopia. And this is just devastating because of its risk factors for developing progressive disease. When do people develop myopia? The vast majority of myopia is brought about during the, uh, during the winter months or the fall months. Um, we see a, a reduction in the in the starting of myopia in the summer months and the progression of it. So it's something about this outdoor time. We got to get kids off of screens. We got to get kids doing activities that do not just involve near working, including reading, but more importantly, screen time. And we have to get children outside where there is sunlight. And that is a big component even in the Pacific Northwest, where I live, getting children outside, there's something about uninhibited sunlight, which uh, appears to be a reducing the uh, reducing a child to get myopia. So here's some interesting statistics about schooling. Very little myopia is avail is is prevalent in societies that that don't go to school. A national education development myopia increases. The prevalence of myopia increases as children take academically oriented classes, and especially those who achieve higher grades. Adults who complete more years of schooling or have higher education qualifications tend to be more myopic. And there's a higher prevalence of myopia in Israeli Jewish boys attending an Orthodox school compared with that of their sisters or of children in secular schools. It seems as if maybe we don't have full evidence that we can say this for certain because we don't have randomized trials, but continuous near work or working distances may be more important than total duration of time when it comes to this. So we need to be looking at these risk factors and how we may be able to impact them. So what's the big deal about myopia, right? Is there a safe level of myopia? I was celebrated as a minus one when I was in optometry school because when I turned 45, I would be able to see up close without reading glasses. I just have to simply take off my, my correction. So I was celebrated. Nobody told me that my risks were higher. With every increasing diopter in myopia, you have an associated 67% increase in the prevalence of myopic maculopathy. These increases also are showing with glaucoma, post-subcapsular post cataracts, uh, and retinal detachments. In fact, as we look at each different refractive component, we see these overall odds ratio, these risk factors as a minus one. I didn't know that I had a two times greater risk of developing glaucoma a three times greater risk of a retinal attachment. You know, when I see these kids who are seven years old and they're a minus one, looking at their future, they're a very high risk of developing minus five, six, or seven. And that leads with it a 21 times greater risk of a retinal detachment and a 40 times greater risk of maculopathy than if they were anamotropic. Can we do something about it? Uh, we sure can. So I, I challenge you in your in your own practice, when you have patients who are over 70, 75 years of age, for you to look and for you to say, hey, what which of these patients have have had high amounts of myopia? 
If you've got a way to measure their axial length, measure it. And what you'll find is that those individuals with high myopia, their risk factors for having this visually, un, uh, the uncorrected visual, uh, visual uh, having a visual impairment, excuse me, is so much higher when they have high amounts of myopia. They have a, a risk factor of visual impairment, blindness, and their the increases from 3.8% to more than 90% when their axial length is greater than 30 millimeters. So with that, the takeaway is that as your eyeball grows bigger and stretches, your risk factors for all of these diseases go up incredibly. I think we oftentimes don't think about our 70, 80, 90-year-old patients as high myopes because they've had cataract surgery. But the reality is if you look back and look at the patients who have these diseases, you ask yourself, why is it that, they, that we're seeing more and more diseases? And the reality is likely because we have more and more myopia. Do we have more disease as a population than we had 50 years ago? We didn't have the ability to take care of it or detect it, but do we have more of it uh, than we did back then, right? My grandfather was an optometrist from 1950 to 2000, and his ability to detect, monitor, and, and manage disease just is nowhere near what it is for me. And uh, we kind of have to ask those questions about uh, the abilities of things. So let's look at an ideal optical system. We have a object and an image receiving that object like a camera, and there's a flat image plane. And we've, we've seen some studies that Earl Smith has done that per peripheral vision drives the central refractive error development. Uh, they tested these, uh, these monkeys uh, and they obliterated the fovea of one eye and both eyes developed the same refractive error. In the second test, they obliterated the peripheral retina of one eye, and the treated eye became more myopic. And so we see that there is something about this, this, this change to the, uh, the foveal region. And here is what would happen in a normal patient is they, they have this flatter image plane that is uh, more high, uh, hyperopic in its defocus in the periphery. It's further behind. And what this is appearing to do is it drives the retina to get longer so that this peripheral focus remains intact. And we have several ways that have been hypothesized over the years to slow down the progression of myopia, one of them being gas permeable lenses. And gas permeable lenses by themselves have been studied specifically, does wearing a flat K generalized just gas permeable lens slow down the progression? Katz did a study 2003, Wally in 2004, and compared to the control, gas permeable lenses did not slow down. It maybe sped it up, but did not slow down the progression of myopia. Another one that is common is the undercorrection of patients. And Alder and Chung did these studies, and they looked at undercorrecting patients versus giving them full correction. And what they showed is that by doing so, we actually increase the amounts of myopia that the patients have. And this is a key thing. If you do myopia management and you're correcting patients with spectacle lenses, um, and some patients you do myopia manage on others that are spectacle lenses, you need to see all of those kids back at six months. Because if you corrected a minus one patient with spectacle lenses and they come back and see you six months later, and now their refractive error is a minus 150, and you leave them in the minus one correction, this study shows you that they will become more myopic at their second year eye exam than if you had corrected them from a minus one to a minus 150 at that, that, that six month visit. So we must be accurately correcting the refractive children. 
What about spectacle bifocals? We all have learned that this is a good way. And the reality is that it may slow things down a tiny bit, but it may be more indicated for patients who have an esoposture or an accommodative dysfunction. And in those cases, what we do in our office is we prescribe vision therapy to resolve those issues rather than giving spectacle lenses to just compensate for them because it does not appear that it is making a huge difference to slowing the progression of myopia. But spectacles do have hope. There are several lenses that are in the works or that are available internationally that have been shown to be very, very effective. The Hoya Myosmart uh, Myo lens, the uh, Stellis lens and sight glass. These lenses, uh, I have had patients who have come in wearing these because they've come down from Canada or they've uh, been referred to us from Hong Kong. And uh, they'll bring these glasses in and then we, we see what we can do to try to improve things. But uh, certainly an alternative that we will be seeing here in the United States in the coming years. The Myosmart or the DIMS lens, uh, the way that it works is there's these, um, these rays of light go through multiple different segments. One that has somewhat of a distance prescription and then one that has a plus 350 myopic defocus, and then there's a central area of nine millimeters where the patient is able to see in the distance prescription. So spectacle lenses are on the horizon. We intend to hopefully see them in 2023 at some point. Self multifocals, uh, distance center, uh, appear to be the lenses of choice. And uh, what the studies kind of show us is the higher the ad power that the patient has, the better. One thing about these lenses that appears to be really key, and the evidence is coming available to us, we, we don't necessarily have all of the studies figured out to make sense with this, but oftentimes soft multifocal lenses decenter just a tiny bit, which means that in the pupil region, we may be actually getting the distance correction, but some of the near correction as well, not just from the peripheral rays, but that, that uh, distinction between the plus and the minus correction that patients are having may be what is slowing down the progression of myopia. And we'll speak about that again in the orthokeratology section. And it may be that that glare, that shadow, that halo that an adult patient would get that makes multifocal lenses not the most ideal thing, it may be the very thing that is reducing the progression of myopia for patients. So we can uh, do all sorts of lenses. You can do custom lenses that correct for tericity. Uh, there are several daily disposable lenses, NatraView and the MySite, the Cooper multifocal, Proclear multifocal, and there are of course, are other lenses available uh, that are that we can be ordered customly. So we can't really give a state of the union without talking about the first FDA cleared device for myopia management in the United States. I had the opportunity of interviewing my good friend Justin Kwan on the podcast, and then later uh, Paul Chamberlain, who was the researcher in this particular study. But the MySight lens is uh, made some hu huge innovations. And one of the best things about the MySight lens, beyond just the fact that it slows the progression of myopia, is the depth of research that they have done. We've got six years of data on how this lens is revolutionizing myopia for our patients. So let's look at the chart for the first 36 months of lens wear. And we're looking at axial length changes. What you can see is the group of patients who were in the orange, and that was the control lens, they progressed uh, over the course of um, the 36 months by, a, uh, by a, a considerable amount. In the first year, they progressed 0.24 millimeters, second year 0.22 millimeters, and in the third year 0.16. And what you can see is as these kids are getting older, 0 0.24, 0 0.22, 0 0.16, they progress a little bit less just because these kids are getting older. But in the MySight group, 
we saw progression of 0 0.9, 0 0.09, 0 0.11, 0 0.10. There is going to be progression in axial length of the child progresses. An emetrope is going to progress somewhere between 0 0.6 and 0 0.12 uh, uh, millimeters in, um, in, in, uh, over the course of a year, depending on their age. What you can see is at 36 months, they took the study group, the control group, uh, excuse me, the control group, and they switched them over to wearing MySight lenses. And now you can see how their progression slowed down considerably. So when is the best time to do myopia management on a kid is today. When is the second best time would have been, to, would be tomorrow. Maybe the best time to start is yesterday and the, the next best time is today. But if you if you can get to it sooner for children, uh, all the better. And there was less than 0.5 millimeters growth throughout the six year, which is just astonishing that we were able to slow the progression of myopia by this much. Other lenses available, the Natribu is a distance center lens, uh, and this doesn't have the depth of the research that uh, the MySight lens has, but it is available into higher powers. And uh, Jeff Walling did a study looking at the amount of plus. So if you're using the Biofinity uh, D lens, um, it appears that there was a, a, a bit of a better effect in the randomized trial with the use of a higher ad power that it helped with uh, with progression even better than those patients who used the lower ad power. So what is the amount that a child should have as much as you can possibly give them? And uh, they don't complain the same, which uh, is also similar to if we had given a 40 year old some atropine, what they would deal with and how much they would struggle with that. Uh, but for kids, because they have an a, a adequate amount of accommodation and they can seemingly, uh, they're, not as, uh, they're not as frustrated by the glare, shadow, and halo that a multifocal would give. If you give a 35-year-old adult a plus 250 uh, multifocal lens, they wouldn't do well, but children do very, very well with it. So atropine is not available uh, as a um, prescription medication in the United States unless it's compounded or you use some of these specific pharmacies that, uh, that, that, that have it. You can have it compounded in pharmacies and that can substantially reduce the price, which is really the right way to go. And we recommend that you prescribe your patients 0.05% atropine whenever possible. The state of the market just seems like that is the direction that we need to be going for patients who are utilizing atropine. Uh, as an example, the LAMP study showed the, uh, the beneficial effect of this. Let's go to the study and look here at the graph. The top graph shows us the spherical equivalent refractive component that the patients had. And when you look at the placebo, you can see that over the course of this 12-month period, they progressed in their myopia by nearly a diopter. Whereas when we look at the correction for 0 0.01, 0 0.025, and 0 0.05, the progression was substantially less. Instead of 0.8, we were at a 0.2 for 0.05%. And the one thing that is, is, is needing to be brought up here is that you may want to taper the patient off of the atropine a little bit. Um, uh, if you don't taper, you're still going to get a beneficial effect versus having not treated the patient, but tapering may make, the, uh, make, the, the, make it last a little bit longer than myopia effect. You can see that we have similar data here for the patients who did uh, axial length measurements. And in this particular arena, we can really see that we're able to slow down not just the refractive error, but the, my, uh, the axial length component as well. In the three-year data, it backed us up all the way on that. You can see how they randomized the group here. This is a busy slide of how the randomization schedule uh, went, but they just went to placebo 
And eventually they added the, the placebo group to a 0.05%. And uh, there was groups that they, uh, they kept in the, in the drop and then kept the, the groups that they washed out of the drop. And here's what you see happened in the group. Let me point you your attention to the orange line. And what you can see here is that the orange line showed the slowing of the progression all the way out to 24 months. And then at 24 months, a group of children continue using it. And then some other children washed out. What you see here is that the children who washed out somewhat immediately without you know, much of a, uh, a tapering effect, they still showed a slower rate of progression than the group of children who took the lower concentration and continued to take it. We could see maybe if we extended those lines a little bit longer that possibly uh, they would overlap. But um, this is just going to show that we can su substantially increase the, uh, the myopic effect when we are uh, slowing the myopia by putting patients in the higher concentrations. And here is the axial length data, which also proves the point of the higher concentration being more valuable. Now, but what is the consequence of this? Most of these studies were done in Asia with darkly pigmented eyed children. And that extra melanin in the iris may have affected how things worked for them versus a blue-eyed individual, say, from the middle of America. And uh, for that sake, when we put a patient on an atropine, we just check to see how they're doing after a couple of days or do a follow-up with them and see if they're adapting to it. Worst case scenario, you may reduce their accommodation a tiny bit and you may make their pupil a little bit bigger, which could have an anti-myopia effect to some degree as well, but that may be too troublesome for the patient. So we always go to the highest concentration and we back off if we need to. In our practice, we wanted to specifically look at how the things that I brought up to you really shake out with regards to the use of atropine, soft multifocals, and a section I'm going to go into in a moment, and that is with the orthokeratology. What I did is I had my, uh, my resident, who is brand new to using myopia management, had done very little in school beforehand. I had her keep track of the number of uh, treatments that she was doing. And uh, of the 253 uh, myopia management patients that she was uh, first seeing in her residency, we saw that about 68% of them were doing orthokeratology uh, and an additional amount were doing combination treatment, which was usually orthokeratology plus atropine. So nearly 80, 85% uh, 80 of the patients in our practice we're using orthokeratology or orthokeratology plus atropine. And we find as we look around offices around the, uh, around the country that more and more people are finding the value of utilizing orthokeratology for their practice. But yet, according to a recent study uh, done by Michael Lipson, it, orthokeratology only counts uh, for a, a, something that about 7% of all optometries do, 4 to 7% of all optometrists take on. And of the people who are doing orthokeratology, 90% of all orthokeratology is done by a very small percentage of people. And what that just speaks to me is that orthokeratology seems to be this nebulous abstract thing. And so the state of the union is orthokeratology is an incredible way to slow the progression of myopia and an incredible addition to your practice. And I would highly encourage you to consider bringing orthokeratology into your practice. And there's three main kinds of ways that we can do orthokeratology. Many of us are very familiar with the diagnostic fitting sets that Paragon CRT has. Those have been around for a long time. You can get diagnostic sets that have lots and lots of lenses and you can take a lens and put it right on the patient's eyes. 
There's also a topography-driven design, something like the J&J &J, uh, ability lens or the BE lens. Those lenses are, you use the topography to figure out what lens should be ordered. You order the lens, you do a topography measurement, and then to troubleshoot, you can utilize the topography and have it kind of help you. And then there's a third type, which is called empirical fitting, which is very often done in, in, in a, 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 one of the easiest ways to get into orthokeratology. And that is where you just take the Ks, the Rx, and the HVID, and you send it into the laboratory, and then they send you a lens. So does orthokeratology work to slow down the progression of myopia? Absolutely, it does. Uh, well over 50% in the vast majority of studies have been shown. When we look at myopia management research studies, there's an important thing for us to keep, uh, keep in, in, in mind. And I just want to bring this up at this point. In clinical practice, if I am seeing a child and we're doing myopia management on them, and I see the patient for six months, and if at their six-month visit, they have not slowed down in their myopia management to the level that I would expect them to, I may add an additional treatment, say atropine, or I may switch treatments to something else. And then at their one year uh, appointment, I would expect, or three, three months later, or even a year appointment, I would want to see that the change that I made is slowing down the progression even more. But in research studies, you don't get that option. You have to follow the child regardless of the amount of progression that they are having. And so as we look at studies that show the amount of myopia progression that is happening with a certain type of design, we may actually be underestimating the amount of myopia uh, cessation that is actually happening. It's likely could be very much higher in our practices. So to say that 60% compared to spectacle lenses with orthokeratology, it may be much higher because if at that 60% mark, I see a kid not doing well, which would drive that number down, I may change them or change the design or do something to improve upon it. That's really important to be able to say that because if we only are helping 50% of the children, then it, that's not enough. Uh, but we can help far more of them by understanding who are the responders and who are not. Orthokeratology does some unique things as it flattens the central cornea, but more importantly, it steepens the mid peripheral cornea. And by doing that, it causes a hyper op it causes this hyperoptic focus to be altered. And we can drive that image plane onto the peripheral retina, particularly in the foveal region. So we will be getting this disparity right in the fovea that will reduce the progression and the elongation or the enlargement of the eyes. One study that I want to bring up to you to show you the simplicity of doing orthokeratology on our patients is what we can do uh, with a study like the SMART study. In this particular study, they looked at soft contact lenses and orthokeratology, and after three years, they showed a substantial difference in the progression of myopia for those kids using orthokeratology. But what was more important about this study is it showed the simplicity. In eight of the 10 sites that were in the study, they had never used orthokeratology before. They, they had never used this particular design in orthokeratology before. So it was a new design to them. It was the Euclid lens in this particular study, which is the empirical ordering. So they ordered based on the Ks, the Rx, and the HVID, and they had an 80% success rate with just the first set of lenses that they ordered. Now, I've gone to other uh, companies and I've asked them what their first lens success rate is, and they, they report similar numbers, 80 to 90% first fit success when empirically fitting. In this particular study with one lens change, 95% success. Now, when we look at other things that we're doing, dry eye treatments, whether we're looking at soft multifocals, would we say with our first go, that we are 80 to 90% successful. I wouldn't say that the dry eye medications or the 
you know, treatments that I might be using for a soft multifocal would necessarily achieve these. So this is the reason why orthokeratology can be used more so in our practices. And I would encourage you to be looking into what can we do, even from an empirical fitting standpoint, with the Ks and the Rx and the HVID for your patients. One other aspect uh, is how we can use multiple treatments uh, to enhance the effect. This particular study looked at the additive effects of orthokeratology and 0.01%, the lowest concentration that I would ever consider using in slowing the progression. And even with 0.01%, the dual therapy, OrthoK Plus, was two times more effective at slowing the progression of myopia than orthokeratology alone, and was 2.6 times uh, uh, more effective than when it was used with, with atropine alone. Now, what about people who are already highly myopic? Is there a way that we can slow the progression for them? And there is actually, there, uh, there was a study that was done on high myopic children where their spherical equivalent refraction was at least 5.7 diopters and their myopia was minus five or more. They were included in this particular study. And what they targeted with the use of orthokeratology was that they would get to about a minus four residual myopia. So they were treating anything above a minus four. And then what they did is they had the children wear single vision spectacles for the four diopters or so that were left over. And what they showed is that they had a reduction in axial length elongation of 63% uh, over those children that were just in single vision alone. And so this shows that even with high myopic patients, we can slow the progression of their nearsightedness uh, by using orthokeratology and even correcting just a portion of it. Now let's talk a little bit about the future, and then we'll talk about how or some ways you can implement myopia uh, progression into your practice, myopia control. One of the things that I think is really exciting is technology. And this is just one example of that. This is an instrument that does axial length measurements. It also does a, an auto refraction and auto keratometry. And so this is a device that can fit into the primary care optometry practice and replace the auto refractor that you have. Anytime I would want to do axial length on a patient, I also want to do an auto refraction in my practice. And so by adding this into a device that is already in my practice means that I don't have to go buy something as another box to sit on the shelf in my already crammed space. There are other devices that are available that have a topography and an axial length, or the Pentacam, for example, has an incredible uh, variety of different things that can be done. But what I would encourage you is that when it comes time for you to replace an instrument in your office, always make sure that you're adding multiple different devices in so that you can get a faster return on that investment. And this is something that I think is very, very key and cool about that. Now, I already mentioned the spectacle lenses, but this is the future. We're going to see this rolling into our practice in a bigger and better way. And it's gonna allow us to do myopia management on more and more children. And I think that's really exciting for us as an industry to be able to add this in. Um, I, I do predict these lenses are gonna be more expensive than uh, polycarbonate single vision lenses for your practice. So you are going to need to know how to measure axial length, make sure the children are not progressing. And if they are knowing what to do, you're going to need to be able to sell something that is more expensive to your patients, likely. Also, the uh, Bausch & Lomb is working on a, uh, a lens as well that is an ortho-K lens. And we do see that AccuView already has a, a lens that's the ability orthokeratology lens. And we likely will be seeing a soft multifocal from Johnson & Johnson 
at some point in the future. It's already released in Canada. So if you're Canadian and listening in, that's an exciting thing for you. And that seems that lens appears to be fairly legit and very exciting about, about that lens. So it brings up this question, you know, when we are looking at, um, when we're looking at kids who have myopia, you know, this young lady on the screen, she is, uh, you know, she's 16 years old and she is a, a minus eight, right? At this point, do we just let it go? Or is she somebody that we should bring in and see if we can slow down the progression to her myopia, right? This would be a great example of somebody who can do orthokeratology for half of their prescription, wear soft contact lenses the rest of the way. Somebody who could wear a soft multifocal lens, slow down the progression, or even wear spectacles in addition to one of those, right? What about this kiddo, right? This kid is uh, a four years old and is a minus two, right? What are we going to do? We're going to just wait until they're six, seven, eight, nine years old and then prescribe glasses, at which point the kid is going to have progressed from a minus two to a minus five. Um, so how do we intervene there? And as the future really boils this down for us, I think it's going to become more and more clear. There are people that are out there who are ready to take these type of children on. In my practice, we fit children as early as three, four, or five in orthokeratology. Uh, we do atropine on these young kids. And uh, there really is some great ways that we can help slow down the progression of myopia. Now, I think it's important for you to understand that as a whole, the population is becoming more and more myopic. And getting into myopia management is not necessarily an easy thing because it, it means you're going to have to think about some things that are different, right? If you had never managed glaucoma, what would you do? Yeah, you'd think about what is the process going to be? What equipment do I need? How am I going to go about this? And there may be an investment that goes into this. But if you, you take out what you're going to be charging and conservatively say that you're going to see 20 myopic children in one year, most patient, most, most practices are going to be able to pay off any of the equipment that they purchase in that first year. But the reality is if you already see children and you only see 20 myopic children who do some sort of vision correction with you, spectacle lenses, soft multifocal, orthokeratology, you're not bringing it out very much. You have way more than 20 children already in your practice, let alone if you did any marketing to grow them. So the barrier to entry of cost is not a very good one. One of the things that oftentimes is a barrier for practices is getting your team on board. And really, I think a critical component of this is to find somebody on your team and sit down with them and say, hey, I, I want to bring this into our practice. And I need to develop one person who can be a champion for me and help me bring this out to our patients and our staff and our team. Have that person lay out with you at, at staff meetings, at team meetings, have that person be the person who's in charge of this. And that way, when you're talking with parents, when you're doing frequently asked questions, they can be writing down these questions and you can develop content. You can develop resources for the patient. And there's plenty of resources already available through industry, but having somebody like this can be really helpful. My, uh, my friend Dwight Barnes did a great job on my podcast laying out how he went about creating this. And then what are you going to charge patients, right? Um, so this can be a little bit. Uh, failure to value your services makes it so that you're not excited about it. So within myopia management, oftentimes people charge a global fee that covers all of the follow-up visits. Some people do treatments with, with various a la carte different things, and they charge per visit and per lenses. And then Andrew Nurker brought up to me, and this is what I do in my practice, is we do a subscription model for our patients. And then develop a cost. What are you going to charge for your new versus your established patients? 
develop an agreement of answers questions and frequently asked questions that people are going to do. What happens if I discontinue, break, so forth? What are the warranties that patients have? You know, we we came up with a warranty uh, for patients who break a lens, right? If they if if they want a warranty, what are we going to do about it? And we came up with a warranty to work and help cover the cost for our patients. For us, our warranty typically covers the cost of the lenses to us. That way we uh, don't lose a lot of money if the patients end up needing to use it, but we're not really there to make a ton of money if they, uh, if they choose to or need to use it. And then create something of a video that shows some statistics. Share that on your social media, share that with your patients ahead of time before they come in of why we want to do this and why it's important to help slow things down simply can be done with your your phone right this is the best marketing tool that we have and then show resources for your patients if you don't create a demand it's going to be really difficult so get out there and start speaking to other people in your community Get out there and start marketing about the myopia uh, in, 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 in your practice. You can do Google AdWords and Facebook ads, Instagram ads, talk to pediatricians, naturopaths, and pediatric office. So all in all, this can be something that can grow in your market. And for the State of the Union, those people who are crushing it in the myopia space are doing this very thing. It's not complicated. It just takes a little bit of time. My recommendation is to designate, if you, this is something that you want to do, designate two hours a week of laying out what needs to be accomplished. And then during the week or during those two hours, start, start adding it up and, and start going through the different things. I'd be happy to help you. My resources are available. You can get a hold of me through social or uh, my email, and we can start laying out what needs to accomplish over the next couple of years uh, in, in order to really grow your practice. And I bring I bring that up because over the next couple of years, it's an incredible way to grow your myopia practice. If you saw 50 patients this coming year, did myopia management on them, and then you lost half of them, that would mean that you would grow, Right. The following year, you'd have 25 established patients plus an additional 50 new patients, right? So 75 patients. And let's say you really didn't do a good job and you lost half of them, right? So you can see how this can exponentially grow, especially if you don't lose as many patients, and it can become a substantial part of your practice. It is not difficult to have myopia management become 10 to 25% of the total revenue in your practice by seeing a smaller segment. And the most important thing is you're not just doing it for the money, but you're slowing down the trickle of glaucoma, macular degeneration, retinal disease for patients. We're stopping it at its source rather than letting it progress. And I think that's the state of where myopia is. We are seeing this tipping point where people are tipping over from letting disease happen to stopping it at its source. Thank you. And uh, if there's anything I can do to help uh, you in your myopia journey, please make sure to reach out. You can see my resources here. Thank you. All right. Hey, thank you, Dave, for a great presentation on the state of myopia. Here's hoping everyone took away some trim pearls to use either tomorrow if you have clinic or on Monday morning. But before we conclude this session, I know you all are excited to know the next graphical, which is MIGS, M-I-G-S, MIGS.